good morning everyone and good afternoon or good evening in, um, in, in, in whatever part of the world you are. Uh, my name is Prashant Kumar and I am the uh, founding director of the Global Center for Clean Air Research and the Associate Dean International for the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences at the University of Surrey and also leading uh, this uh, uh, project which we call it SCAN uh, which stands for Street Scale Greening for Cooling and Clean Air in Cities. So it's a collaborative project between the University of uh, Surrey and University of Wollongong, uh, which is supported by the UGPN, which is the uh, University Global Partnership Network. So on behalf of the project team, including my co-chair uh, for this workshop, Professor Pascal Parrish from the University of Wollongong, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor um, Amelia Hadfield to open this webinar. So Amelia is our Dean International of the University of Surrey since January 2021, leading the International Engagement Office in supporting um, the strategic goals of the university on partnerships with other universities and networks worldwide, enhancing the cutting edge research cooperation as well as staff and student mobility. So she joined uh, the University of Surrey in January 2019 as the head of the Department of Politics and chair in European and international affairs. Previously, she worked as director of, uh, for, uh, of the Center for European Studies, uh, which is a Jan Monet Center of Excellence and the Canterbury Christchurch University. After positions in Brussels uh, and the Institute of European Studies, where she uh, directed the Euromaster degree as well as educational development. Uh, thank you very much, Amelia, for your time today. So um, over to you. Thank you so much, Prashant, uh, and a warm welcome uh, to everyone, um, um, whether you're here uh, in the UK or whether you're in Australia or perhaps, uh, excitingly, uh, another country as well. Um, so this is the, the third and the final webinar um, of SCAM, uh, Street Scale Greening for Cooling and Clean Air in Cities, uh, Healthy Green Streets. Uh, it was an absolute privilege uh, to, to be at the other two as well. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so the co-chairs today are Prashant Kumar, who's just introduced himself, and Professor Professor Pascal Perez. Um, I'm really delighted to see um, the incredible amount of um, innovation um, and cooperation uh, at the heart um, of SCAM because I think it's a, a very nice microcosm um, of the, um, the sort of philosophy that we have uh, um, behind the UGPN and the University Global Partnership Network uh, binds together four universities, um, the uh, University of Wollongong obviously uh, and the University of Surrey uh, as well as Sao Paulo and North Carolina um, in, in the United States um, and they have worked together Together for the better part of a decade now um, and producing a huge amount of um, co-publications, co-authored publications uh, of, a, of a very high standing. Um, I think what I'm particularly interested in is the way in which projects are scaled up very, very successfully uh, at the UGPN. They can start from a small amount of seed funding um, as, as this one has, and then they slowly sort of grow and morph uh, into a larger, uh, a more consolidated entity uh, in which not just the depth and the, and the quality of the, of the research is, is at, the, uh, at the heart of it, uh, but also increasing numbers of colleagues from either side uh, are slowly brought in, which is wonderful. Um, and this bilat uh, between Wollongong uh, and Surrey, I think is a particularly nice example, not just of cutting as cutting edge research, Research, but a sustained and sustainable uh, research group. So it's absolutely wonderful to see uh, a Green Street Clean Air and a Green Street Cool Street webinars, uh, which were held in March and June. And uh, uh, Prashant tells me with usually, usually great excitement uh, how much this research is making a difference. And I know he's absolutely right. Um, so it's certainly, I've seen firsthand its impact here um, in, in Surrey and, and wider Gil Guildford as well. So today, of course, you have the pleasure of a whole host of expertise uh, divided into two sessions. Um, the first theme is green landscapes, pollution and heat. Uh, and the second one is greening tools, public engagement and step learning, STEM learning. And I'm hoping that I can, I can just uh, finish my teaching um, in good time, enough to be able to join that second one, um, hopefully. Uh, in the meantime, it's a very real pleasure on behalf of the University of Surrey to uh, welcome you um, and to wish you the very best luck for what I know will be a very high quality webinar. Prashant, thank you. Oh, you're still on mute there, Prashant. There you go. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Amelia. Um, I'm going to just go through very quickly um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, about this, uh, the, this webinar. 
So just to start with, the, um, this webinar is recorded, so uh, it will be available on the uh, GKS YouTube channel uh, later on. And please keep your microphone on mute uh, when you're not speaking. Please type any questions you may have uh, using the chat box. So the, the chairs will uh, pick those questions uh, for, uh, for the, um, the speakers and they can, um, you know, they can address them uh, towards the end of the talk or end of the, uh, the session chair, um, you know, will make that selection basically. If there are more questions because you've got very limited time, uh, you know, um, on the webinar. So the SCAM project, as we briefly mentioned, so it's basically uh, a, a networking grant between the University of Surrey and uh, uh, the University of Wollongong, and that builds upon uh, the work we have been doing here at Surrey, as well as uh, you know, the colleagues at Wollongong. So the idea there was to uh, look at to developing a GA framework uh, and uh, have some comparative studies in uh, Australia, as well as in the UK. And we were, interested in looking into the uh, roadside hedges and the green screens, but also looking into the native, native species uh, in the two continents. And then combining this uh, knowledge into um, the, the kind of a, uh, you know, the, the, the framework that could help uh, uh, you know, understanding the pool, pollution and pooling trade-offs. So, um, but at, apart from that, since it's a networking grant, so there is uh, other objectives in terms of uh, fostering the student and uh, staff exchange, developing and writing uh, you know, the joint publications and establishing a platform for the collaboration, like uh, uh, you know, we have been doing by expanding the network. So there has been a number of colleagues uh, you know, involved uh, in the project in the very beginning, uh, but then there are a number of others actually who joined, their names are not mentioned here. So, uh, so that, is, that includes the team from uh, the Wollongong as well as uh, uh, from Surrey. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can read the names on the screen. Uh, but we also got a number of uh, uh, the early career researchers uh, you know, involved in that. So uh, there were like three of my PhD students, um, Mamta Thompson, so she's a, uh, a dual PhD student uh, with Wollongong, General Barweis and Arvind Tiwari. And then we got a couple of uh, postdoctoral researchers from my team, uh, Dr. K.V. Abhijit, Dr. Juan, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Gopnath Kalashman. So they have been kind of supporting you know, the work uh, uh, you know, in the background among a number of other GKL members. Um, we had uh, in the beginning uh, the review that looked into the Steve Canyon improvement. Then we had a very recently a publication looking into um, the roadside hedges. Uh, then we had a, um, a, a paper where we had uh, uh, talked about this tool HESDAVE, so it's like a public engagement tool, so you will hear about that later on. And then uh, looking into uh, some of the work uh, related to the, uh, the heating effect uh, of the green infrastructure and the exposure doses, so what kind of you know, the impact it has. But there is quite a lot going on at the moment as well. So we are wrapping up uh, some of the studies, so you will you'll learn more about them. So I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Professor Pascal Paris, to introduce the program and our other uh, chairs for the first session. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, do, do you have a, a slide with the agenda? Uh, you can share with me or? Is this on the screen? Yep, that's one. That's the one. Perfect. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, thank you all for being with us at this early time or late time of the day, depending where you are. Uh, maybe some of you are uh, lucky enough to be just in the middle, so that's uh, perfect timing for you. So what we're going to have first is a, a first session uh, chair, co-chaired by Professor Lydia Morawska uh, from QUT uh, in Brisbane, but also affiliated with University of Surrey. Uh, and Dr. Hugh Forred uh, from the University of Wollongong, who's uh, working with me. Uh, in this session, there will be three presentations, uh, followed by question and answer. Uh, myself, uh, Professor Pascal Perez, uh, then uh, Professor Barbara Maher from University of Lancaster, uh, and then we can finish this session with uh, Dr. Rene Marcin Prokopavicius. Hopefully, I, I pronounced it correctly. Sorry if I didn't. Uh, and then the second session uh, will be chaired by Professor John Watts from University of Surrey and Professor Claire Murphy from the University of Wollongong. Uh, in that session, we will hear from Dr. David Fletcher, uh, then uh, from uh, our uh, um, PhD students, Wendell Barwais and Mamata Thompson, uh, uh, alongside Professor Prashant Kumar, who's supervising these two students. 
And finally, Associate Professor Sebastian Fouch, uh, Cheryl Gadja, and Professor Prashant Kumar again uh, about another project, followed by question and answers and concluding remarks. So I think now it's time for me to give the floor to Lydia and you. Thank you very much. Um, and now we haven't had a chance to discuss with my co-chair how, how are we going to do this, but uh, I'm proposing that I will introduce the first speaker and the uh, rules of the game, and then Hugh will introduce the second speaker, and then I introduce the third speaker, and then we co-chair the questions. If that's okay, Hugh? That sounds great. Thank you, Lydia. All right. Um, now, the rules of the game are such that we are stick to the time and we are already two minutes late. So I'm just noting this. Um, and if uh, the speaker comes very close to the time, then we will remind them that uh, that's the end. So without further ado, I will introduce the first speaker, which is um, senior professor Pascal Perez, who has a very impressive um, uh, range of activities and careers. And I'll just briefly uh, tell you what he's doing. So he's the director of the Smart Infrastructure Facility at the University of Wollongong, overseeing research in infrastructure related fields such as water and energy efficiency, future transport and mobility, smart cities and communities, as well as infrastructure system, engineering and logistics. So this is really a lot. And then he's got quite a number of other affiliations related to the um, simulation society, modeling and simulation society of Australia and New Zealand uh, and uh, positions in the UK advisory board of UK's collaboratorium for research on infrastructure and cities. And this is just citing a few of them. Otherwise I would be eating too much in uh, uh, Pascal's time. So Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lydia, you're too kind. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Usually it works. Can you see my screen now, full screen? Yes. Okay, so let's dive into it. Greener streetscape for a more livable Western Sydney. I've tried uh, at the end of this year and, and nearly at the end of this fantastic collaborative project to summarize all, all the work, the collaborative work that University of, of uh, Wollongong has been doing in Western Sydney and, and try to get some lessons. So it's not too heavy on the science, it's more about the, the reasons and, and the collaborative aspects of this uh, research over the last couple of years. First, uh, if, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to begin my presentation by acknowledging the Wadi Wadi people, traditional custodian of the land on which I meet you today, uh, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend uh, this acknowledgement to uh, and respect to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island, Islander people here today with us. Western Sydney. Is it the promised land? Uh, for the ones in, in Europe uh, who follow uh, uh, more or less what's happening in Australia, uh, the city of Sydney is expanding west, uh, which means that the ocean is on the east. And as you can see on this uh, Google uh, map, uh, we're going west in the interland. The further west you go, the hotter it is, uh, and actually the less access to water you have as well. So this is the promised land. Well, we've got a rapid growing population. Uh, these are territories of uh, uh, new, for new immigrants uh, to settle in Greater Sydney because the housing is cheaper or worse cheaper uh, and because that's where land is released and the housing is slightly cheaper for new houses. So an increasing population uh, at a very high rate up until COVID, of course, hit uh, Australia and the city. It's going so fast that uh, three years ago, the government of New South Wales and the Commonwealth have decided to split Sydney into three cities. And there will be a Western Parkland city, which is the Western Sydney we're talking about as, as an individual entity uh, with a new airport uh, to be open, hopefully in 2026. There are regular and increasing uh, heat waves affecting this part of Sydney, uh, when uh, sometimes in summer you can reach 35 on the harbour uh, uh, by the water. Uh, it's not uh, um, uh, just uh, a mystery that you're going to reach probably 40, 45 
in the western suburbs like Penrith, for example. There's definitely a deficit of green infrastructure and some of my colleagues on thing on the call uh, are, are specialists of, of the vegetation uh, of Western Sydney. And finally, we've got an air pollution problem due to the geography uh, because we've got the dividing range, which is a mid, mid altitude kind of, of uh, hills uh, uh, along the east coast of Australia. But this is a trap for hot air, as I mentioned, but also a trap for pollutant. And there's also because it's a, a, a popular, originally a, a blue color uh, kind of, of environment, there's a lot of industry still located there. So the perfect storm. And you, we've got already uh, some signs that something is getting pretty wrong in Western Sydney. Uh, there's a lack of green uh, quali quality green space. Uh, what you can see on the photo uh, at the bottom is a typical uh, green space, so-called, uh, that has been developed over the last 10, 15 years in most of the city centers in Western Sydney. Not much shade, imported trees, uh, just the kind of thing you don't want to see uh, in, in city, modern cities affected by climate change. Probably something that is very remarkable with for a big city uh, uh, like, uh, like, like Sydney compared with European capital cities is the impact of bushfires, a bit like the west coast of the US uh, for, for Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, we've got regular bushfires, big ones, threatening ones, uh, and they have an impact. But what has an impact also is the way we try to prevent, or the authorities try to prevent these bushfires to get out of control, which is hazard reduction fires. But these hazard reduction fires, depending on the wind, uh, and especially uh, just before the summer season, uh, have an impact on air quality in Western Sydney. And finally, because of this encroachment, uh, never ending encroachment of urban landscape, there's a loss of native vegetation, which is suited to this landscape. Very hot, getting hotter, not much water, and we replace it with modern vegetation for modern cities. So how do we work there as a university? Well, I, I would call it some kind of coordinated and collaborative R&D approach. Uh, why coordinated and collaborative? Because uh, uh, unlike Prescient, uh, sometimes I'm jealous of Prescient at this center with uh, uh, pluridisciplinary teams there and, and you can do everything. Uh, at University of Wollongong, we've got a different approach where uh, several centers and you've got three ones there who are really at the core of this approach collaborate together and they've been collaborating for many years now. The Smart Infrastructure Facility uh, I'm the director of, and especially with my colleagues Hugh Forehead, who's on the call today, and Johan Barthelemy, who's leading our Digital Living Lab, the Center for Atmospheric Chemistry with Claire Murphy, who's on the call uh, today, and, and Nick Dutcher uh, as well. And finally, the Center for Sustainable Ecosystem Solutions, and many of you probably know my colleagues, uh, Chris French and Owen Price. But not only the university, but also with the Western Sydney community. So we've had, had a long relationship now with Liverpool City Council and the university has got a campus there. Uh, Campbelltown City Council, which is a neighboring uh, council and Transport New South Wales, uh, where people are more and more aware of the fact that uh, more of the same and business as usual won't work for Western Sydney in the future. In terms of how do we collaborate and coordinate, well, uh, it, it won't be a surprise to most of the researchers uh, on the call today. It's trying to get a strategic research approach in the long term while having a tactical funding approach uh, to get the research happening. And what I'm going to describe here, and again, very lightly, are four successive or slightly overlapping projects that help us to again have this strategic view on, on how we can help Western Sydney as researchers. So the first one I will mention is a smart pedestrian Liverpool project funded by the federal government in 2018 um, and led by SMART. Then we had the Skull project uh, a year later funded by UW through a global challenge program. Then I'll mention the, the, Greece, the green bus stops, uh, which is the latest one partly funded by UGP and already mentioned by Prescient. And we have a, uh, a common, a joint uh, PhD student, Mamata, 
who hopefully is going to come to us if the new variant of COVID doesn't again close the door to Australia. And finally, the Bushfire uh, Cooperative Research Center uh, with our colleague uh, Owen Price in particular, uh, that has had a, a lot of activities uh, uh, over a bigger period, longer period. So the first project, uh, it was funded through the Federal Smarter Cities and Suburbs uh, um, project, grant project. Uh, what's remarkable with the project, which won an award a couple of years later, uh, it's, it was the initial phase was an extensive consultation with the communities. Uh, and in particular, using serious game. And I know that Prashant with this team will we, we'll mention uh, gaming for STEMs later on. So I'm, I'm quite uh, interested in what's gonna, it's gonna be said. So we, we've used with colleagues from Archilab in Denmark. We've developed two uh, serious gaming uh, platforms. One, which is some kind of monopoly, Archinopoly, and another one, which is an app we can use in the street for people to start putting greeneries as a collage and sharing this with councils. And for example, the, 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 the first two weeks of this uh, smart uh, pedestrian Liverpool, we had this Archilab, uh, uh, Archinopoly, sorry, games where people told us, well, if you tell us that this uh, project of yours in order to monitor air quality and looking where people walk and where people drive in the city, that it's not Big Brother and we understand that now. Well, we think that with all the problems we face, this is where you should put your air quality sensors and this is where you should put your smart cameras. And this was a fantastic start of the project rather than installing cameras and having people starting to ask questions down the track. And one of the outcomes, one of the main outcomes of this project was, as I mentioned, the fact that we, we designed and, and uh, deployed uh, air quality sensors, PM25, PM10 mainly, and, and temperature associated with them in the CBD. So you can see this map in the middle here, that's where all the sensors are located and now still maintained by the council and pedestrian traffic. So smart CCTV, cam CCTV cameras, but during the game, we educated the people who attended about the fact that they were totally privacy compliant. There was no photos, no names, nothing. It was just about how dots, how data points were moving around the city we were interested in, in order to, again, better place the air quality sensors. And what also encounters were counting anonymously uh, uh, ping from mobile phones. This get, got us within two years a very clear picture of where people moving and the air quality peaks and troughs in the city. And again, the system is still running as I speak. Then the second project that just piggybacked literally on, on, on the first one, uh, the smart cities for understanding living in Liverpool, SCOL which is a bit scary name, uh, but again, uh, it's, it's a remarkable project uh, le led by uh, our colleagues, uh, Hugh Forehead and Chris French and, uh, and Claire Murphy. Um, and it was about trying to understand what makes a good green space and what we have to change in Liverpool. As I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of change because I, I put this photo uh, on purpose. This is one part of Liverpool along the river. Uh, but this is the only real green space you're going to find in Liverpool. So how can you expand that vision? How can you share this vision with a broader community? Um, so this, was a multi this is a multidisciplinary team, engineering, atmospheric chemistry, science, and, and city planning, and again, partnership with the council people. Some of the outcomes uh, of uh, this study that have been published by, by my colleagues uh, is the fact that there's a significant difference in both people and, and air quality. So people movement and air quality uh, uh, data and, uh, and, and uh, pollution levels between different sites, as you can see on the right hand side graph uh, for different sensors. Uh, and the graph under is where people dwell uh, during the day uh, with CC, at different CCTV cameras. Uh, one of the results is that PM25 concentrations frequently exceeded national limit of 25 microgram per cubic meter, uh, as you can see on the top graph. And uh, the worst air quality was in places where with mainly short dwelling times. So there was a little, little bit of a sweet part of the story that where people tend to dwell a lot, uh, this was not the worst place in terms of air quality and exposure to pollution. But nevertheless, as you can see the top graph, that's quite scary uh, for people, young people and older generation as well. Um, 
all the findings from the skill project uh, is the fact that, again, with engagement with communities and council colleagues, accessibility was a major problem. Uh, accessibility to green spaces, uh, I mean. Uh, cities divided by major roads, uh, major arterials, a, a rail corridor, and the river, which can be benefit, a benefit, but for the moment, it's more an impediment for people to get into the green spaces. Uh, in the green spaces I mentioned, it's about quality, and the study demonstrated, and you can see some of the graphs there uh, about the surveys, lack of shade in green spaces. Wh wh why do you need a green space with only grass, uh, uh, sorry, uh, but you know, some kind of typical British grass in a city that will reach 45 degrees during summer? Uh, problem of maintenance of these green spaces, of course, and what kind of facilities do you attach to these green spaces to attract people there? The third project uh, I want to share with you today is the current one, and uh, that's the direct collaboration with, with Prashant and his team. Uh, and this is the green bus stops. So here the idea is to uh, literally taking some of the ideas that Prashant and his team have been developing in UK uh, about green screen and green infrastructure for cities and focusing only on bus stops and looking at what kind of green screens, what kind of plants and if possible natives can be put uh, around these uh, bus stops in order to trap as much as possible pollution, knowing that most, unfortunately, most of the buses in Western Sydney are still running on diesel engines. Uh, another aspect is to try to encourage people to take public transport. Uh, and, and here, this is, a, this is an idea that uh, uh, came to me uh, thanks to the fantastic program that uh, was created in, in London a couple of years ago about edible bus stops, creating micro gardens around bus stops to attract people and incentivize people to take the bus uh, and, and just to send a message that tr public transport is fun, public transport is a social activity. And One more minute, good... Pascal. Yep, I'm all good. Uh, okay. And. <laughs> Trust me, Lydia. Uh, and uh, the, the good thing is that uh, we started collaborating with uh, Liverpool Council uh, with two sites, two bus stops. Uh, but when Transport Resources heard, heard about the project, uh, they said, well, we need something uh, along the express bus corridor we're putting in place for Western Sydney going to the new airport. Uh, and that was very encouraging to us to see uh, this new thinking from Transport from New South Wales. So the screens, you can see one, it's just a photo montage for the moment. Uh, the way it's going to work, oh, sorry, I missed uh, one slide, doesn't matter. Uh, it's, the sensors will be in the, in the screen uh, and uh, measuring air quality on both sides of the screen. Finally, smoke from bushfires. Uh, again, you've seen these photos, I, I'm sure, at least on TV. Uh, this is a, a very scary uh, uh, vision when you see uh, uh, the, the Harbour Bridge, like on the right hand photo, this is not smog, this is not fog, this is bushfire smoke, and it smells like hell. And this is dead in the city uh, of, of Sydney. And uh, so our colleague Owen Price and the whole team uh, for the Centre for uh, Ecological Solutions uh, conducted a uh, very thorough uh, um, monitoring of a couple of uh, regional bushfires that uh, could have had an impact on Western Sydney uh, using mobile and fixed sensors, some of them uh, provided by SMART and designed by SMART, and mapping literally the smoke plumes going into the city. What we can find here is that, and again, uh, just to clarify, these are hazard reduction HR burns, not a bushfire, a wild bushfire. So these planned things, and the whole debate now is the fact that we try to save lives and assets to avoid a big bushfire, but we're creating a, a maybe an as dangerous hazard just by the amount of exposure uh, we put people in Western Sydney to PM25 and PM10 due to these hazard reduction fires. So that, there's, there's definitely a, a public debate now in, in, uh, in Australia, in Sydney, and more specifically in Western Sydney about burn or not to burn, literally, a Shakespearean uh, kind of dilemma. Um, and everybody agrees that good monitoring is essential. So all the councils now start to have their own air quality sensing network. 
And more importantly, they all collaborate and bring all this information into a common portal for all Western Sydney, which is great to see. And finally, in terms of exposure, uh, our colleagues from the university work again with council and developers to look at airtight, properly ventilated housing in Western Sydney during hot days or during uh, bushfire uh, or hazard reduction fires. I think that's all from me. Thank you very much, Pascal. This is absolutely fascinating. I hope that we'll have some time for questions at the end of the session. We don't have questions now. So I just uh, would like to remind everybody to put questions in the question box. So at the end of the session, we can choose uh, which questions to address. So at this, I'm passing to Hugh to um, introduce the next speaker. You on mute, you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Professor Barbara Ma, uh, who's the director of Lancaster University's internationally renowned Centre for Environmental Magnetism and Paleomagnetism in the Lancaster Environment Centre. She uses magnetic methods to resolve environmental processes and problems, including magnetic monitoring, sourcing, and human health impacts of particulate pollutants, and magnetic cleanup of contaminated waters. Her highly cited PNAS publication demonstrated the presence of air pollution derived metal rich nanoparticles in human brains, a discovery that indicated a mechanism for observed relationship between exposure to human, sorry, exposure to air pollution and neurodegenerative disease. She's used roadside tree leaves both to measure and mitigate airborne particulate pollution. Over to you, Barbara. Um, good morning, good evening, everybody. Can you all see my slides? Yeah, super. Yes, uh, so yes, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about our work on uh, using magnetic measurements to uh, both measure as a proxy uh, pollution, particulate pollution across urban environments, and then to identify and quantify uh, the improvement of air quality using green interventions. So it, I, I don't know whether it's the same in other countries, but in the UK at the moment, there's a really, really strong debate um, about the impacts of roadside vegetation. And in particular, uh, what most modelers are currently calling dispersion effects compared to particular deposition effects. So why is this really important? Well, we all know that traffic related air pollution is the largest single source of particulate matter to which most people are exposed most of the time. We also know that exposure to roadside particulate matter is a, a really big hazard. And that's uh, in terms of brain health, heart health, lungs, the development of unborn children uh, and so forth. So we know that roadside vegetation has two, two effects. It changes the airflow along streets. Therefore it changes the, the distribution and dispersion of particulate matter. It also removes particulate matter through the deposition of particles on or in leaves. Now, clearly the competition, if you like, between those two mechanisms is really important because it will determine the air quality at the level of pedestrians and road users, as well as the amount of PM that leaves that area uh, subsequently. Excuse me, Barbara, I don't think in presentation mode, uh, we're not very at full screen. Oh, sorry, hang on a sec. Any better? Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, yes, in this country at least, um, the modelers have come to the conclusion, and this is just a very recent paper that I'm, I'm showing here. Um, as you can see, this is the quote from Pierce et al 2021, the benefits of deposition are dwarfed by the effects of urban vegetation on local pollution dispersion. Um, and again, in case you didn't get that message a bit later in the same paper, the deposition of pollutants to vegetation benefits air quality, but the magnitude of this benefit is small in most street contexts. And there's that word again, it's dwarfed by the effects that vegetation has on local pollution dispersion. So far, all of the work I've done on this in terms of measurement, not modeling of PM removal by vegetation, suggests that this view is misguided. So for me, the critical factor in all of this is this thing, the deposition velocity. So it's the quotient of the particle flow rate 
towards the leaf surface compared to the atmospheric particle concentration. So as it says here, the, the, the resulting velocity is normally given in centimeters per second. Okay, so that deposition velocity in centimeters per second. Now, some of the modelers, so this is a paper from Santiago et al, 2017, they can see that if you include sensible values of deposition velocity, then your modeled estimates of the relative importance of deposition compared with ventilation or dispersion, if you include sensible values of deposition velocity, then they see reductions in PM of between, in this case, 20 and 30 percent. And that's using a low value of deposition velocity. So Santiago is a modeler. He's rather unusual. He says that results suggest that street vegetation below building roof height with a high deposition velocity efficiently mitigates air quality problems in streets. So this is an unusual modeler. Um, if we go back, there was a very good review paper by Litchke and Cutler in 2008. And again, they've got it. Your estimates of how much PM is removed largely depend on the value of deposition velocity that you put in your modeling experiments. Now, here's the thing. Most modelers, it seems to be almost a, a sort of convention. They use values um, normally actually between 0.1 and one centimeter a second. When in fact, if you measure deposition velocity in the field, you will get values considerably higher than that for certain specific species. So we will actually measure values of three or four or even 10 or more centimeters per second. So that's, that's the critical point. If your vegetation, your selected vegetation species has a, an ability to, to capture, uh, to have high deposition velocity values, then you can actually see uh, an improvement in air quality as opposed to this su supposed dwarfing of the effects uh, of deposition by uh, airflow and dispersion changes. So, so this is a, a table showing published deposition velocities. Uh, for a range of different species by a range of different authors. And, and what I've just put up there in the pink band, these are the values that people using CFD modeling of street canyons and particle uh, deposition or dispersion um, with, with street vegetation. This is the range of values they tend to use. So they never generally use a value bigger than one centimeters per second. Well, of course, if you look at this table, you can see that there's a whole bunch of species that demonstrate significantly higher deposition velocities. This is some of our data that we've, uh, we've worked on in, in, uh, in Lancaster. And again, you can see the species specific nature of this value. So down at the bottom of our table, we've got species like beech and birch up at about three, four and a half centimeters per second in their deposition values. Now, how important is this? Well, if you look at this diagram, this is telling you how much vegetation you would need to deposit significant amounts of traffic emitted particles. And you can see that the diagonal lines though, they represent plants of different deposition velocity values. And what we've done is we've, the blue curve is for our silver birch, 4.6 centimeters a second. So if you do the calculations, we find that if we had eight silver birch trees, uh, with a canopy diameter giving you about 125 square meters of leaf surface area per tree, then you can see that we would actually be able to remove about 50% by deposition, 50% of the traffic derived PM. Conversely, if you look at the red diagonal curve, which represents the modeler's chosen value often of deposition velocity of 0.1 centimeters a second, you would need a thousand trees in 100 meters of street, which clearly is impossible, impractical and feasible. So that choice of, if you're modeling, deep addition velocity that you put in your model, if you're planting of species that demonstrate the most, uh, the highest values of deep position velocity, that information is utterly critical. Why is all this so important at the moment? Well, it, it, the bottom line is, if you're actually misrepresenting the amount of PM removal uh, in your modeling work, basically you're disincentivizing local councils uh, to, to mitigate 
air pollution, particular uh, particulate pollution, uh, to mitigate that hazard, especially for those that are most vulnerable and the most heavily exposed. And in the UK, it's been calculated that even if you reduce PM 2.5 by just one microgram per cubic meter, you can see the data for yourself. This is expected to save of the order of 3.6 million life years. So that would be equivalent to an increase in life expectancy of 20 days for people born in 2008. So this is really, really important stuff. Sorry, that was a picture of cocktails because Christmas is coming. Um, the reason that's there is because airborne particular matter, you'll all be aware of this. It's, it's a real mixture, a real cocktail of components, both primary and secondary, uh, inorganic and organic. Our work has been concentrated on uh, the metal rich solid particles in airborne particulate matter. We find in urban atmospheres that these metals are always enriched at the roadside. So all those metals that are listed here, which are really quite um, hazardous to health, included in the urban particulate matter, we find invariably strongly magnetic particulate matter. That stuff's coming from combustion, it's coming from abrasion, in particular, the magnetic stuff is coming from vehicle brake wear, uh, as well as from exhaust, tire wear, road dust. So we find in our urban environments that about 10% of the solid particulate matter is composed of iron rich and strongly magnetic nanoparticles. So where do those particles come from? What do they look like? This is some pictures of very typical magnetic nanoparticles that we see coming from, uh, uh, from traffic related sources. So that these iron rich particles that are absolutely abundant and ubiquitous in urban airborne pollution. So these top right, these are particles collected at the roadside in Birmingham, UK, bottom left from diesel exhaust pipes, bottom right outside Lancaster bus station. Okay, the magnetic base of this talk, just very briefly, you, you can see here, We've got these magnetic measurements shown up the y-axis of these diagrams in each case, plotted against sort of more conventional air pollution measurements. And you can see just how strong the correlation is between our magnetic measurements of these particulates and the, whether it's the NOx content or the particulate mass uh, or whatever conventional measure. The benefit of this is you can make these magnetic measurements really quickly on a range of different materials including tree leaves. Okay, this is just a quick demonstration of all the different potential sources of magnetic material and how magnetic vehicle brake wear is compared to other sources. I'm gonna shoot along because I'm gonna try and cover quite a lot of stuff here. Um, ju just, just in passing almost, our work has demonstrated the presence of these metal rich nanoparticles in human brains, in the brainstem, as well as the frontal cortex. Uh, other people have demonstrated the presence of these metal rich particles in the blood and in pleural effusions. Uh, we find them inside the myocardium of the heart. Um, and we've also found them in the gut wall and in the placenta. So these particles literally get everywhere in your system. Oh, if you um, magnetically extract the particles from human brains, this is what they look like when they've been concentrated together. And again, if you just look at that picture in A and compare it with what I showed you before, this is the stuff pumped out into the urban atmosphere and it's getting right into our brain cells. I'm going to just click on um, quickly. So. Here's a picture of a silver birch leaf in Norwich in the UK. The micrograph is 60 micrometers wide and you can see the birch leaf is liberally sprinkled with airborne particulate matter. 10% uh, of those particles will be strongly magnetic. So we can actually make magnetic measurements of roadside leaves in order to map particulate pollution across any urban environment. So this is a leaf magnetic map for Lancaster in August, 2014. The diameter of the circles tell you how magnetic uh, the leaf is. Um, and you can see how well these fast magnetic measurements can resolve the different particulate matter concentrations across the urban environment. And here's in a bit more detail. So we, we've talked a lot about smart sensors, low cost sensors, but leaf magnetic measurements are a really fast and cost effective way 
of making those uh, magnetic measurements of particulate matter. Now I want to get into the, the meat and drink. Of course, we can use roadside leaves to mitigate, not just measure, but to mitigate airborne particulate matter. And this is a little experiment we did actually with the BBC here in Lancaster, where um, we had this row of terraced houses on a very busy bit of the city ring road. And we installed, as you can see, a temporary installation of silver birch trees outside half of this row of terraced houses. We use silver birch because its deposition velocity value is nearly four centimeters a second, very good at capturing PM, very tolerant of PM. The downside of silver birch is it's a prolific pollen producer. Um, you can use lime as a good alternative. If you look at these houses, you can see the house with the red door is number 31 and the house without trees outside it, 25. So we put sensors, grim PM sensors inside those two houses. So this is the data from the Grim PM data. This is PM10. And the top diagram shows the PM concentration inside house 31 before we put the trees outside. And the bottom diagram shows the uh, PM inside the front room of the house after we install the trees outside. And if you just look at those two diagrams, because they're on the same vertical axis, and you can see how much decline in indoor particulate matter occurred. And just for comparison, house 25 below here, this is uh, without any trees outside through that same period uh, that the data for house 31 shown. You can see there's no decline. There's no coincident decline in the house that had no trees outside it. Um, we also had an experiment where we had um, a TV screen inside the front room of each of those houses and we just took um, a wet wipe and just wiped an area of the screen, a pre-described area of the screen, and measured the magnetic content of the wet wipe. So this is before we put the trees outside for house 23, 25, 27, 39. Um, and this is, sorry, I've inadvertently pressed something. This is um, the house, uh, sorry, this is the, the wet wipe magnetic measurements for the houses with no trees outside and for the trees outside the uh, front walls. So again, we had two Grimm sensors. As you know, Grimm sensors are very expensive. That's why we didn't have five or 10 Grimm sensors. But again, these magnetic measurements, they're very cheap, they're very discriminating, they're very effective. This is what our silver birch leaves look like before the experiment. And this is what they look like after the experiment. And in terms of the composition of those particles, uh, you can just see how much of that is um, both indicative of pollution so, uh, traffic sources. You can see, for instance, palladium in the um, all those uh, potentially toxic transition metals are characteristic of those leaf deposited particles. Uh, rushing quickly on, I'm just going to talk very briefly about another project which we haven't yet written up. We're just about to write up. And this was in Manchester and it was to protect primary school age children's playgrounds. So you can see we're installing uh, various types of ivy, uh, western red cedar and mixed uh, hedging. I call it treasures, trees managed as hedges, treasures. Um, and here you can see some, some data resulting from those green interventions. Uh, so it's PM 2.5, PM 1 and particle number concentration. And we tried these three different types of vegetation to see which would work the best. And it's clear from these data that the outright winner is the Western red cedar. So you can see the, the substantive decline in all of these measured uh, pollution indicators uh, as a result of interception by the Western red cedar. I can show you that it's deposition of particles that produces that change because I can see the magnetic part, sorry, I can see the particles on the western red cedar plants. And you can see those particles both on the surface and indeed entering inside the stomata of the western red cedar. And there's one of those nice nanospheres, the sorts of things we see inside human brains. And again, here in thin section, you can see those particles have been incorporated into the leaf structure. But another way I can actually show you that 
this reduction is due to particle deposition rather than changes in earth flow. I can measure the leaves and see how much magnetic material has deposited on the leaves since the either since the last major rainfall or at the beginning since we installed the plants. So again, you can see how strongly magnetic the western red cedar leaves are um, after the installation of these plants. So a western red cedar leaf normally wouldn't be very magnetic. You normally couldn't pick it up and stick it to your fridge door. But when it's been sitting next door to a very busy road in Manchester for a few weeks, it is loaded with these strongly magnetic particles. And I'm not expecting you to look at this spreadsheet at all, but we can take the magnetic measurements of the leaves and we can actually do a back calculation to work out how much of the PM emitted on 100 metres of street our western red cedar leaves have removed by deposition. And from our leaf magnetic measurements, we can see, depending on the grain size of the magnetic particles, which is why we have a range of values, we can see that those western red cedar plants have taken out somewhere between uh, 38 and uh, 60, 70% of the total PM emitted along the 100 metres of that street. So, so we, because we're starting from the particles that are actually sitting on the leaves, we can do that back calculation to quantify the amount of PM removal. I don't know how I'm doing for time, Lydia. Am I all right for time? Well, I was just waking, waiting for Hugh to remind you that you've uh, exceeded the time a little bit. So if you could please. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll, I'll quickly race through my conclusions. I was sort of expecting somebody would, would pipe up and say, <laughs> shut up. Anyway, uh, very, very quickly. Um, the conclusions from the work we've done is that deep position velocity is both critical and very often underparameterized in modeled estimates of PM removal by leaves. Um, it's, it's clear as well that, that many of the modelers haven't taken on board the fact that the deep position velocity is both species and leaf trait specific. And once you take that on board, then you can cleverly select, design and locate your roadside treasures they will immediately and substantively reduce airborne PM and hence reduce the health burden, especially on vulnerable and heavily exposed sectors of the population. And my final conclusion is that solid metal rich particulate matter is far, far better deposited on a leaf than in your brain, your heart, your lungs or your placenta. Thanks very much. Many Thanks, Barbara. This is absolutely fascinating. And this issue of the position velocity for, as a physicist, I know very well from many other still, uh, studies. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time now for questions. And I see that there is a very interesting conversation going on in the chat box. So please continue this. And I'd like to in, uh, introduce our third and last speaker for the session, Dr. René uh, Martin Prokopovich who is a plant ecophysiologist who studies the effects of warming and drought on terrestrial plants and the leaf species and uh, ecosystem scale. Her research aims to determine which species succeed in changing environments by measuring plant functional traits related to growth and survival. She obtained her PhD in the southeastern US investigating how warming affects plants in temperate forests. As a postdoctoral researcher, she studies, uh, she studied how plants survived in the dry, semi-arid regions of Western Australia. She now works at Western Sydney University as an ARC Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Researcher, investigating how plants survive heat and drought in urban environments. Renee, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Lydia. I feel very lucky to be joining everyone tonight and also to have these first two great speakers leading me because now I will have less to explain. But before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that today I'll be sharing data that was collected on the country of the Darug Nation. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge that their ancestors have been traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. So global surface temperatures are now 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than they were at the end of the 19th century. 
And as the mean temperature increases, so do heat extremes. So the top two figures on this slide are illustrating that since the, 19, since the 1950s, there's been an increase in the number of heat wave days per year. There's also been an increase in the intensity of those heat waves. Increasing trends in atmospheric vapor pressure deficit have also been observed in many regions around the globe. And that's shown in the bottom panel by these different colored lines. So in other words, warming air becomes drier. High VPD can also be thought of as an atmospheric drought. Extreme climate years can cause widespread impacts. So 2019 was an extreme year in Australia. It was the hottest year in Australia's recorded history, and it was also the driest year on record. In parts of Western Sydney, summer temperatures have now already surpassed 50 degrees Celsius. So this figure here on the left is showing air temperatures that were measured in urban parts of Western Sydney in the Penrith local government area in that 2019-2020 extreme summer. There were three days with temperatures above 50 degrees Celsius. The highest recorded temperature was actually 52 degrees Celsius. So how hot is too hot for plant function? That's not a simple question. So this study was published last year and the authors compiled a global database for plant heat tolerance. So they reported that the global limit is around about 50 degrees Celsius. But leaf temperature does not always match air temperature. Leaves can either be cooler or warmer than the air. And also plant sensitivity to high temperature is a very difficult trend to pin down. It's not strongly phylogenetically conserved across species, unlike wood density, for example. It varies with growth environment, it varies over time, and also with changes in water availability. It even varies with the length of heat exposure and the time allowed for recovery. So it's an extremely flexible trait. So this study was conducted in Greater Sydney, where our current tree canopy cover is 26%, and the state government aims to increase this to 40% by planting 5 million trees by the year 2036. Now, the main focus is really on total number of trees planted with little attention paid to the actual species that are planted. But carefully selecting species will be very important for continued survival of harsher climates. And so today I'll describe a study that looks at urban trees under extreme heat. And this was designed to understand which tree species are most vulnerable to the combination of heat and drought stress and why. So we tracked dieback and recovery with the overall aim to contribute to building more resilient urban green spaces for future climates. So Pascal already gave you an excellent introduction to Sydney versus Western Sydney. So I'll just remind everyone that Western Sydney is regularly six to 10 degrees hotter than Eastern Sydney due to the geography and also the built environment. So this study site was in Western Sydney in a high density urban area that was developed beginning in 2012. So the trees that we studied had been established for about four to seven years before measurement. They were either growing in pavement, nature strips or garden beds along streets, sidewalks, or within small parks. So we've also already mentioned the Black Summer, which is the summer that the study was conducted in. It did make international headlines. And here is a figure from my neighborhood where this study was conducted. And Sydney was blanketed in this smoke haze for months. It was rather unpleasant. Thousands of homes and buildings were destroyed and billions of animals were killed. But you did not hear much about what happened to the urban trees. So that's what we're gonna look at now. So this figure is showing the climate record from the nearest Bureau of Meteorology climate station. That summer, there were 12 cumulative days of extreme heat where maximum temperatures were above 40 degrees Celsius. There was also virtually no rainfall for the first half of the summer, 
which followed two years of record low monthly rainfall and created extremely dry conditions. So the maximum recorded air temperature here was 48.9 degrees Celsius. But remember that temperatures in urban locations did surpass 50 degrees Celsius. So we tracked crown dieback and recovery over the years. So dieback was determined visually according to the scale that's shown here. So if a species average dieback value was over this 15% threshold, then I'm considering that species as damaged. We also collected a number of plant ecophysiological traits related to plant drought tolerance or plant heat tolerance. So in total, there were 23 species. These are commonly planted horticultural species. It included a mixture of exotics and natives, as well as evergreen, deciduous, and drought deciduous species. I tracked a total of 150 trees or shrubs. And at the beginning of summer, 24 of those were already showing signs of drought-induced dieback or stress. After those 12 days of extreme heat, then the number of damaged trees increased to 73, or about 50% of the study trees. So here's a look at some of the dieback, which illustrates that the warming climate challenges the health of urban forests. Understory shrubs and herbaceous plants were especially hit hard, um, but even plants that were partially shaded by buildings did not survive. And some of the highest percentages of crown dieback were found for London plane tree, shown on the upper left, and for red maple on the bottom right. So 13 out of the 23 species exhibited crown dieback and could be considered as planting failures. The other 10 species tolerated the extreme stress that summer. So now I'll focus on which species failed and why. Climate of origin is often assumed to be useful for determining species suitability for urban plantings. So we determined climate of origin for each species using global native occurrence data. And so here I'm showing two different climate parameters that we tested, the maximum temperature of the warmest month and precipitation of the driest month. So are species from cooler climates more likely to fail? No, we found no relationship between temperature, maximum temperature, and dieback. And in fact, the species from the two coolest climates um, tolerated the stress that summer. Are species from wetter climates more likely to fail? So yes, there was a significant relationship between precipitation and dieback, but some species from dry climates survived and other species from dry climates failed, so I don't think that this offers very much potential for accurate predictions. So access to water for urban trees is a bit of a mystery. To quantify potential differences in water access across species, I collected both pre-dawn and midday leaf water potentials in mid-January when the trees were most stressed. And it turned out that there was two possibilities. Trees had access to some water, which I've shown here in blue. So those species had pre-dawn leaf water potentials that were above minus one megapascal. The alternative was that species had access to less water. Um, those are shown in red, and they had pre-dawn leaf water potentials that fell below minus one megapascal. So I did take some soil volumetric water content measurements at the soil at the base of these trees and found that there were significant differences between these two types. So it does indicate that microsite differences in water availability or rooting volume existed. Um, although it could be even more complicated than that because there could be species differences in plant water use patterns or stem water storage interacting. So are exotic species more likely to fail than natives or are species with less access to water more likely to fail? So no to both of those, um, at least within this study site. So predicting tree death isn't easy, which is of course not surprising since it's been a very active area of research for the last couple of decades. 
So let's take a look at some other traits that were not useful in predicting dieback, even though I think they can be quite informative. Um, so tree height or average species height um, had no relationship with, with crown dieback, which is interesting given the fact that several recent studies have found that tall trees are more likely to die in natural forests, but not here in urban forests. SLA, specific leaf area, and also leaf turgor loss point, which are two traits commonly associated with plant drought tolerance, were not related to crown dieback. But there were a number of traits that were related to crown dieback. So here I'm showing some of those. So diameter at breast height or the um, size of species stems. So rather species with small stems were more likely to fail. Um, species with large leaves were more likely to fail, or at least for the two species with the largest leaves in this study. Species with low wood density were more at risk, and species with low leaf critical temperature or low leaf heat tolerance were more likely to suffer dieback. But each of these individual traits was only enough to explain about a quarter to a third of the variation among species. So instead of considering individual traits, um, the next best thing is to move on to a multivariate analysis. And so here we've combined multiple heat and drought tolerance traits that in order to more comprehensively predict the likelihood of species failure. So these were traits that we picked out um, a priori that were associated with either plant drought tolerance or plant heat tolerance. And we created this relative tolerance ranking. So for all of the species that were identified as either intolerant or moderately intolerant, um, they actually did fail. For species that were identified as moderately tolerant or tolerant, however, the trait approach could not separate those that will, will fail from those that will survive. So up until this point, I've been referring to tree species with greater than a 15% threshold dieback value as failures. Um, but let's talk about tree recovery. So the species that had greater amounts of dieback that summer were less likely to fully recover within the same growing season. And in fact, less than half of the damaged trees did recover. Only about 40% recovered that growing season, despite the fact that high rainfall occurred in late summer and throughout autumn. But on the other hand, only about 10% of the study trees actually died or were damaged enough to be removed or replaced. So in total, there were five species with mortality plus another two species where removals or replacements occurred. So there was an economic cost of this extreme climate event. Replacement of turf as well as herbaceous species was necessary and a handful of dead trees were removed or replaced. The local government seems to favor a low cost approach to tree replacements, however, and many heavily damaged trees were not replaced but left in place, um, such as this London plane tree in the lower right that's re-sprouting from the base. And also there were some dead trees that were not replaced, so overall there was a net decrease in tree number due to this extreme summer. So in summary, some commonly planted horticultural species struggled to survive the extreme summer and may soon become unsuitable. About 10% of the study trees actually died, which indicates an economic cost to these extreme summers. In order to protect the urban forest against these future harsh, hotter droughts, and also to provide effective cooling, we need to match species tolerances to site available water access. So for example, tolerant species can be planted in sunny dry areas that lack reliable water access, whereas the faster growing leafy species um, will likely need improved water access through techniques such as, such as passive irrigation storage pits that can capture storm water. I wanted to acknowledge all my funding sources and collaborators and we can move on to the question session. I realize we're a bit behind. Many thanks, Renee. Very interesting. I was thinking how to relate the garden, the trees in my garden who either died or are dying 
how they will be placed on these diagrams of yours. Uh, well, thank you all the speakers. The problem is that we are now six minutes behind, and um, which means that six minutes ago the next session should have started. So if we start now the questions, we will be uh, go even more behind. And I'm seeing Prashant looking at me and he reminded the chairs to keep things on time. So I don't think we will go now into questions. There are lots of good questions. And I just suggest that the speakers respond to these questions. And also I suggest, Prashant, that these questions are copied. And then if there is no time to respond to all of these questions, we continue these discussions online. As I said, otherwise there won't be time for the next session. So this is my proposal. And therefore I propose to pass now to John uh, and Claire, if you are happy with this. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lydia and all the speakers. So uh, just to very briefly introduce Professor uh, Claire Murphy. Um, uh, she is uh, um, from the University of Wollongong and uh, her research is focused towards the, um, the composition and chemistry of atmosphere um, with a special interest in fire emissions, air quality and remote sensing of the atmosphere. Uh, Professor John Watts, a dear colleague from our University of Surrey, so uh, he's a um, uh, so he has some pioneering work done in the area of surface chemical analysis, uh, looking into the method based on electron and uh, ion, uh, you know, the spectroscopy to the material. So I think I will just keep it very short. Uh, apologies for that, and I'll hand over to both of you. Hey, thank you, Prashan. Um, Claire, we've not had an opportunity to discuss this, uh, very much like Lydia and you. Um, I co-supervise the two PhD researchers from the second uh, presentation. So could I suggest that I introduce the first speaker and the third speaker, and you look after the University of Surrey team, would that be okay? That sounds great. And I shall um, uh, wield my stopwatch and be harsher than the, uh, the first lot of uh, chairs you were. You will need to you you definitely need to wield your stopwatch with uh, uh, Yendel, Mamatha, and Prashant. I'm sure of that. Anyway, right. Thank you very much, Claire. That's good. Okay, let's get on, everybody. I mean, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think those of you that were around for the um, the second seminar earlier in the uh, of the year uh, will recall me saying I feel like an outsider. I'm not an environmentalist, but I am good at looking at. Uh, very fine bits of stuff. I do surface analysis, I do electron microscopy and spectroscopy. And I also supervise uh, students with Prashant. I think he comes to me when he thinks there might be just a little bit of material science involved. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to welcome the first speaker in this second session. This is Dr. David Flesher, who works at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. He's a research associate there in GIS and spatial modelling. And the majority of David's work focuses on map mapping ecosystem services provided by urban green and blue space. His recent work includes the development of a new model for quantifying the noise mitigation that's supplied by vegetation, along with the City Explorer Toolkit app. And the City Explorer Toolkit app is exactly what he's talking about today. Uh, the full title being City Explorer Toolkit combining ES models with social data to guide city planning. So David, the floor is yours. Well, actually I should say the screen is yours tonight. We're looking forward to your talk, David. And I'll give you a, uh, a warning if I remember at uh, one minute to go, if that's all right. Thank Dr. you very David, much. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. We can see your screen. That looks really good. Excellent. I will just pop that into... I might be able to help out a bit because I think this might be a bit under 15 minutes, but we will see. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Yeah, this is um, my presentation on City Explorer Toolkit app. Um, so it's a web app, it's created in R Shiny, um, and it's a web app aimed at city planners and officials. The idea is to combine social data and ecosystem service model outputs um, and with a view to identifying the best locations for um, new green and blue space in the urban environment, but also for quantifying the, the benefits provided by existing uh, green and blue space. So the toolkit currently includes three ecosystem service models. 
that's um, air pollution removal, specifically PM 2.5, um, atmospheric cooling by green and blue space, and uh, noise mitigation by woodland. Um, and so, as I said, part of what the app does is identify the best locations to place new green and blue space. Um, it also allows comparison of different scenarios which you can create within the app um, to identify which ones are best. And it also allows you to target uh, particular demographic groups um, and potentially identify social disparities in the supply and demand of the ecosystem services. So um, just very quickly, um, we use the uh, Climate Change Initiative uh, soil moisture data. So this touches on someone someone was mentioning earlier uh, on uh, water availability being a factor in the cooling potential of vegetation. So this soil moisture data goes into determining the cooling potential um, of grassland because it's only top uh, soil moisture. Uh, moving on, so the data that goes into our models um, is the scenarios and these scenarios are essentially land cover um, data. And you can see in the video here, the user can modify that land cover data by drawing polygons and assigning different land cover types. Um, this is currently based on a Sentinel-2 land cover classification, but in theory, you could feed in uh, any land cover classification as long as it has classes that are um, compatible with the models. Um, so yeah, the, the users can um, edit and create their own scenarios. These can be saved and then loaded back up, viewed, and you can run the ecosystem service models on those. Um, the other important aspect within the app is where the people are. So I think Pascal mentioned about where people are. Unfortunately, we only have static population data rather than um, data that reflects the movements of people throughout the day and week. Um, but what we do have is some data on so age groups and uh, prevalence of poverty for this example in Paris. Um, and depending on where you are, different data are, are available. But this essentially allows you to create a, a, a weighted uh, population density layer dependent on the demographic groups um, for each of the ecosystem service models. And that's important because uh, different demographic, uh, different social groups can have um, varying vulnerability to the uh, to the different pressures, but also it helps reflect the priorities of the planners and officials who might be using the app. Um, so you can create these weightings for each of the ecosystem services. Uh, they will be saved and carried on and reflected in the data outputs of the next three tabs, which I'll we'll move to now. So the first one is uh, demand for mitigation. And so cycles through PM 2.5, cooling and, and noise mitigation demand. And these are essentially the, the pressures. Um, and then you can create a combined layer to look at those all together. And you can change the importance of each of those individual layers on the left-hand side of the uh, bar there. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll go through in a sec, sorry, it was quite quick, but you will see the integrated, the weighted, the social weighted versions further down. Um, and that reflects where the people are as well as where the pressures. So this, this is one of the more refined um, social weighted layers here. Um, and yeah, this, this reflects where the impacts are more likely to occur. So high pressures, but also high population density of the groups um, that you've targeted in the social weightings. Uh, moving on, uh, we go to the um, supply tab, and this, this shows, this maps the, the uh, green and blue space that's providing the service. It's quite difficult to see the variation there, but generally higher um, levels of service provided in the southeast of the map um, for most of these. Uh, and that's towards the center of the city. Um, and that will also be reflected in the refined um, social weighted layers because there are more people there. This one here is the noise mitigation. 
and this reflects greater mitigation as you move um, away from the noise source and into woodland areas. Um, so the video is just cycling through. So this is the opportunity tab now, and this shows where the greatest opportunity for providing benefit if you place new green and blue spaces. So this is uh, for cooling. You can see a particular hotspot there. Um, current woodland is essentially uh, whited out on there because that would provide the maximum cooling benefits. So there's no additional opportunity. Um, here we see the opportunity for mitigating noise. It's generally higher between noisy roads and residential buildings, which are reflected there in, in white. Um, I think if we move on to the final tab, so the outputs, uh, the summary statistics, this allows users to load up um, summary statistics from, from multiple scenarios that have been run. So those scenarios that they've created, you can load them up and you can compare them. So it'll give you headline figures for things like the, the proportion of each of the land cover types so that you can compare. Um, but it also values the noise mitigation provided by the woodland, um, quantifies the PM 2.5 removed per year and gives you a mean cooling um, in, in degrees for the entire study area. Uh, these bar charts are customizable and this allows you to reflect both the supply and demand. So that would be the, the exposure, but also the, the benefit provided by each of the scenarios for a typical person within each of the demographic groups here. So for um, noise mitigation, PM 2.5 removal uh, and cooling you can look at each of those uh, social groups and see um, both what they're being exposed to, but also the benefits that they are receiving for each of the scenarios so that you can compare. Um, it also allows you to download um, the, the charts and also the, the data itself as CSVs. Um, it's, it's in development, so some of the things that we're looking to add to it in no particular order. Uh, one thing that we'd really like to get in there is to enable the users to upload their own data sets to constrain the opportunity outputs, because currently there's no reflection of feasibility in there. So for instance, planners might wish to load up a set of um, uh, potential candidate sites for development um, or maybe even uh, other data sets reflecting risks or pressures um, like uh, flood risk. Um, the other thing, so for, for noise, um, we calculate all the way through to monetary value and that, that goes through um, some uh, health metrics on the way. And what we'd like to be able to do is reflect uh, health metrics for each of the ecosystem services. So we're uh, a good way along on doing that for uh, exposure to extreme heat and so to be able to value the cooling effect of, of green and blue space um, and there are relationships out there dose response and um, ways of valuing pm 2.5 exposure but um, i think it's important to try and get localized relationships rather than the general ones so um, that that I think is going to be dependent on which cities we, we actually put into the app, um, whether or not we'll be able to do that. Um, we're also looking to add other ecosystem service models. Um, primarily, uh, we want to get a, a surface flood um, model in there that will reflect the, um, the reduction of um, surface flooding as a result of installing green roofs. We're working on that at the moment but also um, we'd like to put in there uh, an access to green space for, for leisure, health and wellbeing. Um, and the other thing we'd like to do is to be able to increase the thematic resolution of the scenarios that go in. So part of that with the flooding one with green roofs, that will be an additional um, category. Um, and we'd, we'd like to be able to increase that resolution because it enables us to make more complex models that. Um, more reflective of, of reality. Um, and that's it from me. So I should be, yeah, um, a bit under time, but hopefully that helps catch up. Um, yes, thank um, you, David. Yeah. You were 11 minutes, so um, 
but uh, I'm going to try and be quick um, um, so we don't use too much of the time introducing the speakers. So um, it's my great pleasure, of course, to be the person who introduces Prashant, who kind of doesn't really need uh, introducing to any of us, but um, he is the, the founding director of the Global Centre for Clean Air Research. And I'm sure none of us would be here tonight if it wasn't for his great enthusiasm and ability to collaborate and, uh, and get everyone um, excited by, uh, by collaborative research. Um, he really, he, he, his research is really looking at air pollution, their sources, um, but also he has a real strong focus on impactful research to actually look at mitigation strategies and how we can, uh, how we can actually improve air quality. Um, and the other two speakers are Yendel Barwise uh, and um, Maratha Thoms Thompson, who are both doing research uh, PhDs with, with Prashant. Uh, so Yendel is looking at um, relationships between green infrastructure and air pollution, particularly focusing on woody plant traits that influence amb ambient air quality. And Maratha is the, the first of, I hope, many PhD students that are joint between the University of Wollongong and the University of Surrey. Uh, and her research is focused on air pollution reduction potential of various green infrastructure op options in the urban environment. So with no more ado, I'll hand over to them all and um, hopefully we'll have a wonderful talk. From them. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Claire, for the introductions. So what we are gonna do is uh, um, this presentation has got three components of it. So I will introduce very briefly, actually, um, this has a tool and then Amanta and Yendel is gonna talk about uh, their work, actually what they've been doing as part of the ongoing uh, you know, the studies. So that's basically the, uh, the kind of outline here. Uh, <clears throat> so this has date um, it, that it stands for, has designed for abatement of traffic emissions. So, um, you know, as you, you saw um, uh, from the presentations earlier, I mean, there is a, a need actually for the tools which can allow people to understand better that how these, uh, you know, the green infrastructure can help to reduce the impact of, uh, uh, you know, the, the emissions on them uh, via the reduction by deposition and dispersion and so on. So the idea here was that we have been having as part of this Guilford Living Lab, a lot of interactions with the local community and uh, um, that need kind of, you know, arise from there. So what we did is we tried to create a, a public engagement tool. So it's like a first beta version, I should say, it's already online, so you can uh, you can play uh, with it. It's not as comprehensive as you can think as a tool, so I must uh, uh, you know warn you on that uh, that front. Uh, but we are working uh, to improve uh, you know the features into it. So the what it does is basically it uses the concept of uh, um, uh, the street canyons as well as the open road. So for example, in the street canyon environment, what you will end up is that uh, uh, the uh, you know, the, the air will kind of, uh, you know, attract uh, if the height to width ratio of the streets is big. So in that case, if you try to put actually a lot of trees in there, that can make the things worse at the, um, uh, you know, at the ground level where people are breathing, uh, you know, the, the pollution of the street. So, so what we did is um, as part of the work, um, uh, you know, we tried to kind of categorize these into different categories. Obviously, that was based on uh, you know, the, the, the literature and the, the evidence is, uh, you know, being produced uh, today, uh, where we divide that into three different categories into the deep or, uh, uh, you know, the, the moderately deep and the wide street canyons, and see actually where there is an opportunity to put the, uh, the green infrastructure. So this is a, a guidance document which was released in 2019 and that follow, uh, uh, that basically uh, uh, presents actually the concept which I've been, I've been talking about. So what we did is then we tried to kind of take this uh, a step forward uh, to um, build a, uh, you know, the, the kind of a tool. So what we did is we had a number of these engagement activities with the local communities and so on. And then, um, you know, we, we come up with a, um, you know, this, uh, uh, this co-designed um, or the co-development of this tool uh, that basically, uh, you know, talking about, uh, uh, you know, these different geometries. So what you could do is it's very simple, as I said, you can have like a three sort of, uh, two sort of combination there. The one is the open street, so as you can see on the, the left side. So, um, and then you can have, uh, um, you know, the different parameters being put and it will let you, uh, you know, decide or let it tell you actually how much will be the reduction. Uh, and it will also tell you what kind of hedges uh, or the species as you heard earlier that can make a huge difference uh, could be more appropriate for that. So, <clears throat> 
the same thing, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of, uh, you know, that keep going uh, when we go for the, um, the Steve Canyon kind of environment. And there are some screens, if you up, up click on these, uh, you know, these links, so they will uh, pop you up with the, with the other options there as well. So, um, so I think the, uh, as I said, that, I mean, we had this uh, engagement activities um, where we wanted to understand actually uh, in terms of the simplicity that how simple it should be, how we can present it in a way that uh, uh, you know, the people could possibly uh, use it as, a, uh, you know, as an engagement activity. So, uh, and that was very, very positive. And then we try to take into account as much as we can uh, you know, during, uh, during those, uh, those activities. And uh, um, so this is basically there um, uh, on the uh, online, so you can access it. Uh, its counter keeps doubling, so it's almost reached to around 2,000 meters, uh, you know, by, by now. Um, and uh, there is a feedback form there as well. So I think uh, if you are interested in that, then you might want to, uh, you know, go uh, onto it and uh, put this, uh, you know, the feedback form, so that can allow us to, um, you know, um, take into account uh, for the further kind of things in there. So I'm going to pass it on to now, Yendel. Yendel, you can tell me when you want him to change the slide. <clears throat> Could you? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so th this study basically looked at the impacts of different vegetation barrier densities um, across time uh, on um, far side concentrations. So we. We, we understood this, stu this study to improve the hedge state models equations. Um, it lasted for roughly a year, um, and I took leaf area index measurements um, throughout the year um, on, on a fortnightly basis uh, to understand the changes in barrier density and how they affected far side concentrations. Um, so that study completed in 2020, and I'm currently finishing the write up on it. Um, next slide, please. I then planned and have just finished a study into the impact of different um, evergreen leaf types on pollution removal. So I had 10 different plant species um, at the A3 dual carriageway going through Guildford. And this was two different species of five different leaf types. So two needle leaf species, two broadleaf species, uh, and so on. Uh, alongside a low cost air pollution sensor, which was an optical particle counter um, to take uh, real time concentration measurements. Um, next slide, please. So as part of this study, I also took uh, leaf morphological measurements, so of leaf area, leaf hairiness, leaf stomatal density, surface roughness, and so on, um, both before and after um, the study of the control and the roadside specimens. Um, and I also took um, samples from the roadside species before and after different rainfall events in, under, in order to understand the impact of, of rainfall on uh, the capture of different particle pollutants. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, as I say, the analysis for this particular study is ongoing, but the um, the images here on, on, were taken with a, a digital microscope as part of my analysis. And the, as you can see on the images on the, on the left, um, there's quite a lot of deposition at the leaf scale. Um, the, the scale bars here show a distance of 100 micrometers, which is about one tenth of a millimeter. But the majority of deposition actually occurs at the ultrafine particle size range, which is 0.1 uh, micrometers in diameter. So these particles would be too small really to see at this scale and would actually be small enough to enter the leaf stomata. Uh, next slide, please. So for this reason, I've been using a scanning electron microscope to understand the, the number, the density, and the chemical composition of different particles. So this image, uh, this micrograph of a, a Japanese cedar sample was taken pre-rainfall, and it shows just how much deposition occurs at the fine particle size range below. So I'm looking forward to seeing the impact of different evergreen leaf types on the capture of these particular um, particles. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, that's um, uh, an overview of, just to return to the hedge state tool, 
how my research will will form an iterative process in um, refining and revising the tool. Um, and I'll I'll leave it there and pass over to Mamatana to discuss her research here at GCAM. Hi everyone. Good morning. So uh, I'll be presenting two of our um, green infrastructure studies which we have been doing in London and in Guildford for the past few months. So the first study is, uh, is, is around a hedge in a real street canyon in uh, New Kin Road, Road in West London. So here our aim was to understand um, how the pollutant is varying around a hedge in a real street canyon and it's a, uh, it's a wide street canyon of nearly 0.42 aspect ratio. So we had kept uh, nearly a, a lot of instruments nearly uh, in 30 uh, different sampling locations around the head to understand the pollutant variation uh, both vertically and horizontally. So we had kept three sets of instruments. The first set was aimed to understand the uh, reduction, how much is the reduction behind the head compared to in front. And the second uh, set was aimed to find the horizontal variation in the real uh, street canyon behind the head. And the third set of instrument was to understand the vertical variation. So we had kept, so I will briefly uh, explain the findings from the um, findings from the study. So as you can see, we had, found, uh, we had found a graded filtering of different fractions. So we had, we had uh, we had seen a clear uh, reduction in different fractions of uh, pollutants. So there was a reduction of 83% for the nucleation mode particle, which is from 6 nanometers to 13 nanometers, and for the accumulation mode from 30 nanometers to 300 nanometers, and the ultrafine particles and for force particles as well. And also there was a clear reduction for the BC and also particle uh, PNC as well. So this is the, this figure shows the uh, horizontal variation along the hedge. So we had kept four uh, the SCK sensors at four different distance from the hedge. But uh, then there was a clear reduction for PM10, but there was a built up area uh, at three meter distance era, um, behind the hedge. For PM1 and PM2.5, we could observe a concentration increase behind the head that might be due to the inhibition of dispersion. Next slide, please. And this figure shows the vertical variation. So the red line shows the concentration in the front, in front of the head, and the green line shows the concentration behind the head at different heights, in four different heights. So as you can see, there was a clear concentration um, increase at one meter height in front of the head. And the, that is because of the uh, tailpipe emissions and which, which creates a zone of higher concentration at one meter height. And we can see a clear reduction behind the hedge at one meter height, which clearly um, proves that uh, the hedges can reduce the direct exposure from the um, vehicular emissions. And so briefly, these are the uh, conclusions that we could see a clear reduction of um, for the PM1, PM2.5, and PM10, and for the for all the fractions of the particles in, of, of total PNCs. And for the horizontal distribution, we could see uh, the clear reduction, but we could see a buildup at three meter. And also we could see uh, a reduction for the vertical variation, especially at one meter height. And this is our next study, which is going on in Guildford. And this study is around the green wall and it is aimed to understand the interspecies uh, species variation of PM capture and the uh, wash of efficiencies of different, uh, 10 different species uh, of green wall species, 10 different green wall species, and to find out how this morphology of the uh, plants, sorry, the morphology of leaves is related to the PM capture. So this is the setup. Uh, which is near uh, near the A3, and we have selected 10 different species and five uh, plants from each species. So we have been collecting leaves before and after the rain, and uh, we are doing the micromorphological analysis, including the stomatal density, recumbency, and the roughness using digital microscopy. 
and also we are going to analyze the air pollution tolerance index of different species as well. Except this. One minute. Yes. So these are the dif different species which we have selected for the study so we have selected 10 different species uh, in which we have selected five different leaf shapes and in each leaf shape we have selected two different um, species having uh, of la a small leaf and, uh, and one of large, uh, large leaf so the aim is to understand the um, effect of leaf shape and leaf size on the particular uh, pm deposition and also on wash and these are the species which we have selected for the study and we have, I have been doing the uh, micromorphological analysis using uh, digital microscopy in the urine system and density, roughness, and trichrome density. And these are the uh, out outputs from the uh, digital microscopy analysis. Yeah, now, so thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, so I think the, as the next six steps, you know, what we are doing is, as the end of the so try to kind of, uh, you know, um, help improve the has date a tool by incorporating from the findings uh, from these new studies. Um, and uh, we just got a little bit of support actually from the university to, to keep working on this, uh, on this tool. Um, and the idea is that if you can make it uh, um, optimized for the mobiles and tablets, because the, currently the tool is just for the web version and uh, hopefully have a inter improved user interface and uh, have some additional functions. And, especially making it more interactive so the you know the the, the people or the children can play and uh, you know they can understand actually what's going on in different scenarios and obviously there is quite a lot of data coming from these studies so you will uh, you will see uh, them published at some point so uh, yeah so it's uh, basically that's it basically from uh, you know from this but uh, i would like to thank professor john watts who has been helping uh, you know mamta and yendal uh, constantly through this uh, all this uh, the work about this uh, material characterizer and all the team and uh, our, uh, you know, the funders. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Prashant. Well, thank you, Prashant, Yandel, and Mamata. It occurs to me that um, what we've just seen is probably the ultimate role reversal for a graduate student. The fact that the graduate student is doing the presentation and the professor is the uh, the slide assistant. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, Prashant. Okay, let's let's move on now. Uh, the next uh, talk has the rather uh, interesting title of Playful STEM Learning, Introducing the Heat Pool Educational Initiative. This is from Sebastian Puff and uh, Cheryl Guider from uh, WSU, I think, oh, I know, thank you for the slide, is Western Sydney University. A few words about the two authors. Um, Sebastian is uh, an Associate Professor in Urban Studies his interdisciplinary research focuses on the development of effective cooling strategies for urban spaces. He studies the thermal performance of streets, parks, playgrounds, schools, and car parks. With this work, Sebastian advises governments and industry how to improve resilience against heat in our expanding and densifying cities. Now, this will come as a bit of a shock to those of us in the UK, because I went into my office on... Uh, Monday morning, and I think it was probably sub-zero temperatures, although it is warming up a bit now, it's about 10 degrees outside. Um, Cheryl Guider is uh, currently a researcher in the STEM Centre for Educational Research at Western Sydney University, and she's in the final six months of her PhD research, focusing on the impact of hands-on, localised and contextualised learning in primary science education. Um, Cheryl retrained as a primary and secondary school teacher 12 years ago and now enjoys balancing teaching in a primary classroom and researching and working as teaching staff at WSU. I know primary school teachers and they can barely balance primary school teaching with more primary school teaching. So Cheryl, that is really an achievement. Um, her goal is to be part of impacting the future change makers in conservation, education, and science. So Sebastian and Cheryl, it's, and Prashant, of course, I do apologize, Prashant, I almost forgot you. You've been introduced already and everybody knows you. So Prashant, over to you. Thank you, so Sebastian, are you gonna start? Yeah, I can start. 
Yes, please. Thanks for the introduction, John. Uh, I guess we have now again Prashant driving slides, right? So you're you're down the ladder again. <laughs> you 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 okay driving it? Yes, please. Yeah, you tell me. Okay, great. Um, well, Warami and hello from the Daruk and Guringai lands in the north of Sydney. Um, in comparison to John, I'm wearing a T-shirt. It's getting warmer, not colder. We're heading into summer. Thanks again for inviting me to talk at this seminar. This is really a fascinating and um, final talk for today, which, which stresses trends and interdisciplinarity of, of research, where we really bring STEM um, together with educational research um, and, and, and really cross um, the fields that we've been affiliated for a long time. Uh, and now start to understand how we can actually cross-pollinate um, and, and get impactful results from the work that we're doing that really transforms what happens in the real world. Can I have the next slide, please, Prashant? So although my background is in forestry, and that already tells you what kind of journey we're, we're um, all on in our research these days, I have now done quite a bit of research recently in schools and particularly around microclimates in schools. I did look at tree canopy, as you can see in the middle. These are published reports all available on the web. Um, we started with a policy analysis. There's a huge problem in Australia where it was mentioned already, we have to face extreme heat every year during summer. Yes, that happens mostly when we have school holidays, but it happens more and more also on the shoulder side of summers. And that means even air-conditioned classrooms and schools can get really, really hot during um, the recesses in the morning and then for the lunch break where we see nosebleeds and kids getting sent back home just because of the heat. We're trying to find management options, not only to cool classrooms down, there's a $500 million program just in New South Wales to install new air conditioning systems in schools that don't have them. But we're also trying to drive um, change in the outdoor environments. And now we are bringing STEM research to schools to also understand what they need to do from an educational perspective to really train um, younger folk understanding the impacts of heat. Can I have the next slide, please? So from our environmental research um, that we're doing around schools, we are now developing citizen science projects that take STEM technology and bring them to the classroom. This is just one of the programs that I've done with a um, high school up in Springwood, which is in the Broome Mountains, a little bit cooler, but they still get very hot climate. This research, I was lucky enough, um, was featured on an ABC uh, three-part series in 2020, which call, was called Big Weather. We had Craig Rucastle uh, presenting it. Many of you from Australia will know him as a um, very intellectually challenging and um, particularly for politicians, uh, challenging presenter. He came um, out of a, a, a more comedian-heavy uh, television career into making very um, informative and controversial documentaries this one about big weather, and it included a section around the learning at high temperatures. You can watch it uh, if you're interested on iView. Um, it's still up there. We did take our um, environmental research into the classroom. The kids looked at classroom temperatures across their school, and then you can see in this bottom picture, they started to um, demonstrate to Craig in this show how hot the classrooms actually were. From that experience, if you take me to the next slide, please. From that experience where we saw how immediately the kids picked up on doing science themselves and really applying analytical methods to the data that they recorded in their own classrooms, we thought we'd take it a step further and introduce them to augmented reality using infrared thermography to look at heat and the phenomena around heat. And here are just two examples to demonstrate what we mean by that. The cattle that you would see in the bottom picture on the left hand side you can't really see that it's hot once you start using thermography of course it comes up as a very hot object the same when you look at this hand from my wife my dear wife was bitten by an ant a really nasty one and you can see how this bite 
um, causes uh, higher blood flow, inflammation, and so on. And you can you can detect that when you can't really see it on the skin itself. So we can use this thermography to go to the kids and introduce them to understanding heat objects that are hot. Where is it hot? Where is it cold? And then, of course, ask the questions why, which led to the hot, hot, hot cool program that Prashant developed. But before Prashant will talk about that, we also developed a program for Cheryl um, as part of a PhD, which um, I'm handing over to Cheryl now. We'll tell you a little bit about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the Gundangara people from which I now present and live in. So um, just extending uh, Sebastian's work into the primary school setting, um, the Junior Rangers and Schools project was a Western Sydney Schools initiative. And just to extend some of that context, uh, Western Sydney, the Western Sydney regions also um, houses quite uh, vulnerable communities of people and our schools out here are also quite poorly resourced as well. So um, not only is it really hot where uh, we live, um, but it's also quite under-resourced in terms of air conditioning and tech. Um, so this initiative was actually a wonderful um, thing to be a part of. And as I also mentioned, I do live out in Western Sydney. I have lived out here most of my life, raised my family here and have taught in schools out here for 12 years, um, you know, in 40 degree days in a colour bond classroom. So could you imagine teaching in an oven where most kids are just lying down on the ground in the, on the floor because the air condition also doesn't work. So it is a wonderful opportunity to be able to give these students agency in measuring how hot their classrooms really are. So we, so the, the study involved 210 uh, students, 10 primary teachers and two National Park staff. Um, the content was delivered by the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Educators and co-taught with classroom teachers as well. Uh, we encouraged hands-on learning. Um, it wasn't just theoretical based and we moved kids around to different learning spaces, including uh, adjacent green spaces, playgrounds, as well as their own uh, classrooms as well. Uh, it was field work based mostly. Um, it was integrated with science and geography as well. And students uh, were given um, the infrared cameras uh, from, from Sebastian's work, um, which was a first um, to see in a primary school setting. Um, out of those 10 teachers, uh, one teacher very warmly invited me to observe her students of 30. I will preface this by saying that for the most part, these students were quite eco ecophobic. When I say that on their first day of field work, um, they were trying to capture ants and spiders, uh, stamp on them, uh, kick trees. So it was quite an interesting um, transformation to see these kids um, across their journey. Uh, thank you, next slide. Thanks, Prashant. So here we have um, these, these iPads here. So for the teachers who I was involved with, um, not very sort of tech savvy, haven't ever used the FLIR cameras or software before. So I was the passive researcher, but quickly became teacher and uh, directly involved with the research. So I was handed these iPads given the cameras and said, Cheryl, can you quickly just get these together before we start the lesson? And basically took over the, the teaching there. So what we did was we decided to uh, get the kids to have a look at their immediate surroundings. Um, and as you can see here on the left, we've got uh, a student's feet. Uh, so, you know, that there in itself was their aha moment. So I think before that, the students were quite critical about localised heating, um, but as soon as they were, they saw it in the lens of the thermal cameras, um, everything sort of changed and their learning made sense. Now, to give you some context, context also, we were in a demountable colour bond um, building. Uh, 
Um, it was a 15 degree day. So for my colleagues who are in the UK, um, that is actually quite cold for us in Sydney. Uh, kids were all rugged up, the heater was going. So if you can see in the second slide, um, we've got the heater there going full ball um, and the kids were able to see, you know, the hottest parts of their classroom. They were either putting in front of people's heads and having a look at how hot um, people's heads were. Sorry, Prashant, can you just go back? Thank you. Now the third uh, image along, we've got the students going outside their classroom now and they're looking at the different um, landscape in their local environment. So here we have a dam um, with a lot of algae on there. And so students were working around their school setting and they were able to identify the areas that were drawing, um, sorry, producing heat. Um, and we also had great conversations about how their PlayStations and Xbox, Xboxes at home were currently you know doing downloads and how much heat that was actually producing in in the, in their homes not only did we get um, students taking photos but we also had them translate that data into a into a field into a data sheet and then they were able to also um, present their findings in terms of a, a celebration of learning and at the very end they planted at least 100 trees so it was a wonderful way to culminate their learning um, and in the end they they are going to um, you know to talk to their school leaders about how they can make their classrooms a lot cooler and I will add as well that um, two of the things that came out of their learning so when their teacher asked them what was their two most favorite things in their whole seven years of primary schooling as they're moving into secondary one was their camp and secondly was working in the junior rangers program and using sebastian's camera so i think that's an amazing finding thank you everybody yeah thank, thank you very much both. i think you made uh, my life easier to uh, explain uh, the rest of this uh, this talk so um, uh, I would start actually with the Guildford Living Lab. So it's a, a platform which uh, um, uh, you know I've been running it for a few years now at, at the Surrey. Um, uh, the idea here is uh, um, you know the reversing the conventional approach. So usually as a researcher, what we do is we do first and then disseminate, but we want you to engage and co-create first and then do it together. Uh, and you know, so this kind of an approach of the living lab is is kind of reversing, you know, the conventional thinking. So you could see there is a lot of activities with the schools. We have the school guidance, which has been released over twenty countries to date. Uh, plus, uh, uh, they say, uh, you know, the, in the walking nearby, we just set up a uh, the citizen science uh, run uh, the first kind of you know the monitoring network of the sensors. So there's quite a lot going on in there. And then this heat cool, uh, you know, that. Uh, um, was an initiative which uh, uh, you know which uh, started with the support from the RSA. So they it's a charity uh, insurance group actually. So they supported it and uh, thanks to Sebastian to uh, you know um, uh, to, to introduce those uh, those ideas and the technology. And then uh, what we did is then I tried to kind of build actually this program further uh, for the uh, the schools in um, you know in in the UK. So the idea was that uh, it has to be playful. So, you know, so the, the children can enjoy and uh, they can learn about different things. Uh, and especially um, around the climate change, which is a, you know, the, one of the, the largest, issue, biggest issues at the moment, understanding the heat sources, understanding the, um, you know, the, how the trees and the, um, the shrubs, they are cooling and heating the environment, how these cars and the exhaust emissions, you know, they, they look like in terms of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the temperature and so on and what we also did is then we tried to build actually component into it so that we can assess the learning because that's the most important thing uh, or the most challenging thing i should say is to understand whether uh, you know these things are making an impact so we kind of bring the uh, the citizen science ap approach into it as well so uh, you know working with the schools but also the parent teacher association so that they can be part of this uh, initiative when the children are playing with them and uh, uh, bringing in, um, you know, the, some other components to it, like the quiz. So we developed actually the, the fun kind of quiz there so the children can not only uh, learn uh, from them, but we can also understand actually how much they understand about the climate change issue. And then having, you know, the, the, uh, the initiatives like the Heat Cool Master and the Heat Cool Champion, uh, you know, for whoever is, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, participating in. So, so, the, so what we do basically, so we first try to understand actually the, the basic understanding in a playful manner uh, through a quiz. So, um, and one you have minute this, left, uh, you know, the- Minute left, Prashant. 
Yeah, so when you got this, uh, the quiz done, then, uh, you know, we have these uh, different sessions. So the one is the fun and play session, indoor sources, outdoor sources, the infrastructure, miscellaneous. And then we try to do actually the, um, the same quiz again, actually, after we've done the sessions to understand actually, uh, you know, what's going on uh, or whether there has been any change actually in their learning, but also analyzing the images uh, they take, the, uh, the observing the sessions to understand actually more about them. So there is a, um, you know, the, there is a quite a, um, uh, uh, a lot of work in there. So we started with this uh, public trial on Carfree Day on 26th of September. As you can see, we were there uh, on the streets of Guildford where we had our stall and then there were a number of people coming there at different age groups and the children, you know, playing with the technology, try to understand actually what challenges they see and whether they find it interesting or not. And that went very well, so very successful. And then we started implementing into the school. So the first one was in London. And the second one was uh, in Guildford, where uh, you know we focused again, uh, you know, on these uh, uh, the different kind of uh, you know the things you can see some of the researchers working with the teachers, uh, but also the children actually you know they are going and uh, you know playing playing uh, things in different environments. So you can see the the children being quite enthusiastic about what they've been doing. So you can see somebody is trying to look at the the pole actually and see how the temperature varies, and looking at the football and so on. So it's been it's been quite fun actually, um, and there's a lot of work going, uh, you know, behind the scenes uh, to kind of run this activity. Um, and you can see also, you know, the schools actually been very enthusiastic about it. So you can see the tweet, and that came out at the time when the COP26 was going on, where the schools have been kind of you know engaging and uh, um, uh, you know trying to do actually what they could do to improve the learning about the climate change of their, uh, you know, of their children. Um, and then what we did is like, this was quite fascinating. So we just looked at it in the last few days uh, in terms of the quiz. So what you see is a, is a line actually one-to-one. -one. So it's like a free quiz, uh, uh, the marks in the, on the x-axis and the post quiz on the y-axis. So one of the, the very interesting kind of learning from that seems to be that almost majority of the students who take part in the, uh, you know, the, the quiz, their learning has improved, improved actually by, by some, some level. So we are still, analyzing uh, this data, and this also reflected by the questions they answered, um, you know, before the program and after the program. Um, and you can see the green part actually, you know, becoming big. So it's, it's quite interesting, fascinating, it's still going on. So we just start today at one of the secondary schools in Guildford, and we're still looking for more schools actually to participate in the program and, and take this forward. There is, a, there is a video here, I'm not sure whether, you know, you will be able to see that. So we did it on the car free day uh, on 26th of September. Can you hear that? Uh, we can see the video pressure and we can't hear it. It's also quite chopped, Prashant. Yeah, but there's no, no voice, no voice over, no audio. No, no audio at all. Sorry, I'll leave this video and uh, we'll go forward then, yeah, to the last slide, basically, just to thank. So I, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat box if you are interested, so you can watch this interesting video we did on the car free day. So with that, I would like to thank our colleagues and uh, you know, everyone involved uh, you know, in, the, in the initiative. Thank you. Prashant, thank you very much. And also, of course, thank you to Sebastian and, uh, and Cheryl for a really interesting talk. Hey, when I was in primary school, which was a very, very long time ago, um, life certainly wasn't that much fun. Um, I see we've got more than 40 uh, comments and questions in the chat, and we're sort of 15 minutes behind time already. Um, I think what I'll do is uh, offer my personal thanks to all the speakers. I've had a tremendously uh, interesting and informative couple of hours. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. Um, Prashant, what do uh, what would you like to do about questions and things? Bearing in mind we're running a bit late. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what we could do is I will have these questions uh, downloaded and possibly um, you know um, send it through. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, if I've got the contacts of these colleagues actually who have registered, so we can try to follow up. Uh, you know, uh, after that. Um, and uh, um, I have put the link actually on the chat box if you're interested in watching the, the video. Um, I believe that we are already six minutes late, so we don't want to keep actually people in there. Um, so I think with that, possibly I could thank 
both of you and our previous cha chairs, Professor Lydia Morawaska and uh, Dr. Fu, um, for their, uh, you know, the fantastic chairing and all our speakers uh, for taking time and doing those uh, uh, very uh, interesting, uh, you know, the, uh, the presentations and keeping us up to date actually with the work which is going on in this particular area. So um, the, the thing is that this area has been evolving quite, uh, um, you know, quite greatly and uh, anything which people are adding is a plus because it is basically building that understanding. Whether there is a conflict of understanding or thinking, that's a different story, but that's still useful because if we do produce actually the evidences, then I think it will help actually to improve us because this is becoming very important these days to have the greening in the cities. Better understanding we have, more we can do uh, you know, to, to, to achieve together. So um, uh, this video, um, you know, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, possibly in a week time uh, when we had added the, uh, you know, the captions uh, on it. So uh, I will see if I can forward that link as well. Otherwise, you can look at uh, uh, from the, the event page where you registered. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, there as well. Um, uh, so you can watch and uh, you can share actually those videos to the colleagues, uh, you know, who were not able to, uh, you know, meet today. So I guess with that, I can say thank you to everyone and uh, um, and look forward to seeing you at some point somewhere in person or in June. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Prashant, for organizing an incredibly great. Thanks, uh, Prashant. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>